In a mechanical watch, you have over 100 components, even in a very simple movement. And everything has a tolerance, meaning parts can be slightly bigger, slightly smaller, or different in a number of other ways. The wheel and pinion could be slightly taller, slightly spread differently from wheel to wheel, watch to watch, part to part. And so one thing that is the main job of a watchmaker who is assembling a movement is to actually set up all the parts and pieces so that they interact properly with one another. Because from wheel to wheel, in a production run of watches, things will be slightly different. One thing that we set is the end shake of the wheels. Because we have a really limited amount of power going through the gear train of a watch, we don't want to lose any of that power as it goes from the mainspring to the hairspring. So all of the turning parts, the little axles or pivots of the wheels, they fit loosely. Now, not loose in your typical everyday sense, but loose as far as microns go, meaning they can move a little bit. If it was too tight, the power wouldn't actually transfer from the mainspring to the hairspring. There'd be too much resistance. So every wheel can shake a little bit up and down. We call that end shake. It can also move side to side a teeny tiny bit, but that's even a tighter tolerance. These parts all need to be set at the right height within the movement and through the gear train so that they will interact properly. And not only interact properly while the watch is sitting in one position, but also when the watch changes positions. Because of the wheels being slightly loose or having end shake, they will move up and down. And we need to make sure that the teeth always remain meshed with their respective partner. We start with the part of the movement that we can change the least, and that is the balance wheel. The balance wheel will have the least amount of end shake. It will be the tightest fitting part. It needs to move around the least from position to position. So we're pretty much fixed as to where that part is going to be in the movement. And when you flip the movement from dial up to dial down, that part should move very little. The next part that has to interact is attached to the balance wheel staff. That part is the roller jewel, and that roller jewel swings back and forth and interacts with the pallet fork. So we have to set it up so that no matter what position the watch is in, the jewel interacts with the tail of the pallet fork. And this is all achieved by moving the jewels up and down, and also moving things like the pallet fork body up and down on the pallet fork staff. All of these adjustments will be brought into near perfection within a number of microns, so that no matter what position the watch is in, the parts that need to interact with each other will interact, and they will interact in a way that has the least amount of friction. From the pallet fork, you then have the escape wheel, which can be moved up and down so that the teeth of the escape wheel interact with the jewels on the pallet fork. You want the height to be just right so that the wheel never comes free from the pallet fork, otherwise it will just spin. Or if it's too close to the corner of the jewel with the foot, you will actually knock the corner of the jewel and you could crack the corner of the jewel off. Just with one of the teeth on the escape wheel, which looks like a foot. So you will always have this meshing of wheel to pinion, wheel to pinion, and we want those heights to set up just right. The jewels are on either side of the axle or pivot or pinion, whatever you want to call it, and we can tighten those both so that there's less end shake, or we could move them up or down from dial side to movement side in order to make sure that everything inside the movement is sitting just where we want it 
as you go from the balance wheel through the gear train all the way to the mainspring and barrel, each wheel that is larger and has more torque will also have more end shake. The end shake on your largest wheel might be comparatively this large. As we go down the gear train to the next wheel, we have less torque and we want less end shake on that wheel. And the next wheel, less end shake and less end shake until we get to our pallet fork and our balance wheel and you will have almost no perceivable end shake. The way we actually check the end shake on the pallet fork is by pressing down on the pallet bridge. And when we press down on the pallet bridge, you have the pallet fork pivot in the jewel. As you press down on the bridge, the bridge will deform just a little bit, it will flex. And you will see the pivot will come up out of the jewel a little bit further. If we were to just try and move the pallet fork, it's really hard to tell if there's any freedom there. We then have within the barrel an adjustment that we can make, which is the arbor inside of the barrel. And that arbor can move up and down within the barrel, but the barrel arbor itself can also move up and down within the main plate and the barrel bridge. So there are two adjustments there that we need to account for so that none of the parts rub on the bridge in a wrong way or on the center wheel in a way that would have a negative effect. And we also wanna make sure that there's not so much play because if there's too much play, then things can become a little tilted and we'll actually have some negative wear patterns where problems will arise in the future, especially with the barrel, where you have a lot of force once that spring is fully wound. We have some special tools for moving the jewels in very small increments. And this is how we're able to press a jewel a little bit further down or move it a little bit further up. And then we can check after every manipulation of any jewel, we can then check the movement or freedom and shake of that wheel.